So, a few weeks ago, it was actually the week before Easter, Palm Sunday, we started a sermon, and I ended up having to break it in half because, well, that's just what I do. Uh, and we were, we were on this journey to the cross, and we took what we thought was going to be five weeks, now six weeks. Well, we thought it was going to be four weeks, then it was five weeks, and now it's six weeks, journey to the cross. But it's kind of weird because we're already past Easter and the cross, but we're still journeying to the cross. I don't know, whatever. We're still going to call it journey to the cross, the preparation of Jesus Part two. So this is the prayer message that we started a few weeks ago. Uh, we got, only got one of the five components down a few weeks ago. Hopefully you're here with that. We'll do a quick review uh, and then we will get into um, the rest of it here. Um, have you ever prayed earnestly for something? Like, I mean, you, you really set out, you're going to pray. Maybe you even fasted. Like you thought it was, it was what God wanted and God just didn't answer that prayer or maybe I'll say it like this maybe he still hasn't answered that prayer and just let's we're in church we can be honest anybody ever been there just he's praying for something and and it's just uh, God I I think this is the right thing and God still hasn't answered that prayer and that's all of us I mean we all experience that Um, I'm here to tell you there's no magic formula on how to get your prayers answered there's um There are some right ways to do it, but there's no one very specific right way to pray. Uh, There are a lot of wrong ways to pray, and we'll cover a little bit of that too. But this this thing of prayer, it's interesting. God tells us to do it, and if we ask him, he'll give us what we want, but we ask him, and sometimes he doesn't. So where where does that all fit into theology? Where does the, like, like God, are, are, is, was this not right? Am I, do I have a wrong understanding about this? So there's a lot of misconceptions about prayer, and so we're going to talk today fully, fully about prayer. So what exactly is prayer? Well, Prayer is communicating with God. We said that's, yes, that's, that's part of it. Um, is prayer a way to get what you want? Nobody wants to answer that. <laughs> it, it, it is, but let's not look at it like that, okay? That's the wrong way to look at prayer. Um, is prayer something that you do before meals? Yes, but it's not like, the only time that we ought to be praying. So we, we have a lot of misconceptions um, about prayer. Um, when, when I was a kid, I used to pray for a bicycle. Like, I really wanted a bicycle. And, and I grew up not, not having a lot of money, so I, I wanted a bicycle really bad. And I would pray and pray and pray about it. And, and when I grew older, I learned in Sunday school that that's not exactly how prayer works. So I went and stole a bike and prayed for forgiveness. Just kidding. I didn't pray for forgiveness, okay? True story. All right, so what is prayer? So a few weeks ago, our key statement, if there's one thing I really want you to remember from today, it's, it's our key statement. Now, this is somewhat of a definition of prayer, but it's not a full, uh, just all-encompassing definition of prayer. But our key statement for today is, prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Now, pause there for a second. And you can see where I'm going this, with this. We often see prayer as trying to get what we want or all of these different things. But especially for the purposes of today in this message, for the, the small part of prayer that we're going to talk about today. I really want us to have this understanding that this is what prayer is. That it's an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. God, I've got this test coming up or this job interview or or this relationship do you want me to take it further or god i I, i'm struggling in this area or or whatever it is god this is important to me and i want us to see it as rather than god would you fix this problem or answer this question i want us to see prayer as hey god this is important to me 
like this decision is really big in my life. Like this thing that I'm going through is, is really weighing heavy and, and not necessarily, God, I want you to fix it, although God, I want you to fix this thing or answer this prayer, but God, I wanna invite you into my life in the midst of this thing. What a difference is that? You know what that does? That's establishing relationship. That's a big difference between, hey God, give me, give me, give me, genie in, in a lamp, just rub it and get all my wishes, make them come true. As opposed to, hey God, this is important. To just, just will you join with me in this in my life and walk me through this? That's how I want us to see prayer as it pertains to the message today. So prayer is not a lot of things, but again, as it relates to today, prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. But that's how we do it a lot of times, isn't it? We often go to God uh, meals and when we need something, right? A lot of the times, that's what we do. So today is more of a what is prayer? What are some components of prayer rather than a how to pray? Um, so let's break down some of these important components. So um, to do that, we're, we were looking at this passage of the triumphal entry, right? So this is right before Jesus is crucified and he's, he's coming into town, into Jerusalem. So when he would do that, Jesus, during his three years of ministry, he would live up north in Galilee. He would travel down to the south into Judah and he would stay in a little town called Bethany. And Bethany was where the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus was. You probably heard of that guy, Lazarus. He just, Jesus did, did something really cool with him. What did he do? Yeah, he raised him for the dead. Remember, Lazarus stinketh. He stinketh. Jesus raised him from the dead. That whole thing had, had just recently happened. So Jesus, when he wanted to go to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover or go to the temple or whatever, Jesus would stay in Bethany, which was just a couple short miles away, at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So what we see in our story today is Jesus going back and forth, back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem. So that's really important to understand. So um, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11. As you're turning there, I'll give you a second. I'll just read through our key statement one more time. Prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. This phrase, this, this, uh, this definition has been bouncing around in my head for months and months and months. Because one of the questions that I get asked, um, I won't say most often, but quite often as a pastor, is about prayer. Why aren't my prayers working? What, what do I need to do? And so this just, as I'm listening to people and just hearing their hearts, this has just been swirling around in my mind that we just need to invite God into the important things of our lives. So Mark chapter 11, we're going to go down to verse 12. It says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went out to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Now pause there just for a second. There is a whole lot theologically in here that we are not going to break down. Uh, the fig tree represents Israel and, and, and all of that. If you can, you can look that up on another time, we're going to take a little different angle here. But if you're wondering about that. Verse 14. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now, skip down to verse 19. What happens in the meantime, Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He goes up to the temple courts. He sees all the money changers, and they're making money. He gets angry. He overturns the tables and the courts, and he makes a whip, and he drives out the animals, and he says, you know, you're making my, my father's house a, a house of robbers. It's a house of prayer, and that whole interaction happens. And then we're back down to our story, verse 19. It says, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So now they're leaving Jerusalem, going back the two miles or three miles back to Bethany to stay in the house. Verse 20, in the morning, now, now they're in Bethany getting ready to travel back. In the morning, 
As they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Kind of a strange response, isn't it? Verse 23, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. And you may look at that and say, well, that passage, he only talked about praying real quick. How are we going to get a whole message? Trust me, it's there. Five components of powerful prayer. If you're taking notes, I love you a little bit extra. You may want to write these things down. Five components, I was kidding, but not really. Five components of powerful prayer. Now, these are not necessarily in order of importance. They're just in order as we see them here in the passage. So we talked about three weeks ago, number one, the historical component. There is a historical component that we have to remember when we pray. And we said, remember what God has done in the past to believe what he can do in the future. That second song that we just sang, it could not have been more perfect. Good job, Gabe. That's, that song, same God, you are the same God. You were a healer then, you are a healer now. You provided then, you will provide now. You are the same God. We have to remember, look back and see what God has done in our lives. And it, it, sometimes, I know we're in a rut, sometimes it may not be easy to remember what God has done, but God has done so much. That breath that you just took is only because God gave it to you. Remember, verse 20 says, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Anybody remember why he was freaking out? Why in the world? It's a big deal, okay? Jesus cursed a fig tree and it like just withered down to the roots. Why was that a big deal? Because this was the very first destructive miracle that they had ever seen. All of the other miracles that Jesus had done to this point were constructive. And Peter's thinking back going, whoa, I've seen you do a lot of things, Jesus, but I've never seen anything like this. And so he's kind of comparing. He's remembering back to what Jesus has done before. In Matthew, as a parallel account, Peter says something like, how does this kind of power work? Like, Jesus, I've seen your power before, but like, this is, this is different. This is another level. He was remembering what Jesus had done in the past. Remember what God has done in the past to believe what he can do in the future. So number one, there's a historical component. Number two, there's a theological component. A theological component. And that component is the fact that we have to trust. Trust. In verse 22 Jesus just very simply says, have faith in God. Peter had just said, look, Rabbi, the, the, the tree, it's withered. It's, 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 it's like totally dead. What in the world? How did that happen? And Jesus just simply responds, have faith in God. That's kind of weird, kind of a strange response. He's like, trust. Trust that this is the right thing. In Matthew, it says, Jesus said, have faith and do not doubt. Do not doubt. But see, it's, in, especially in this passage, what we're talking about, it's less about your faith and more about trusting in God. Because when you really think about it, does, does God kind of know what he's doing? Usually, right? Do we think that we know better at times? That's a big fat affirmative, yes. But see, we have to remind ourselves, hey, you know what? It didn't work out the way that I was kind of hoping for. Maybe God knows something that I don't. Kind of sounds silly to say it out loud, doesn't it? But see, we have to keep reminding ourselves about that. There's a song that we sing every once in a while. It's called Give Me Faith. 
And the bridge is the best part of the song. It says, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. And then it says, my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. We've got to trust God knows what he's doing. But what exactly are we trusting? There's something very specific here to trust in that will help us go, oh, oh, I understand now. What is it that we're trusting in? It means we're trusting he knows better. It means we're trusting that his will is better. It means we're trusting that his purpose for our lives, although we can only see like three feet ahead of us and he sees to the end, his purpose and plan and will are much better. And that's what we have to trust. Let's look at a couple of different prayers or prayer types. Prayer type number one, God, whatever honors you, God, whatever advances your kingdom, whatever accomplishes your will, Whatever is best for me in your eyes, however that ends up, that's what I'm praying. Now here's my request. Ooh, that's some spiritual maturity right there, isn't it? Is that how we normally pray? Not normally. Not me, at least. I'll I'll take one for the team. I don't normally pray like this. Just throwing it out there, we're being honest. But when we can learn that, we can trust God. He knows best for us, even though, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I want to go through that. I, I just, I don't know if that's the right thing, but God, I'm going to trust you. This is how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, it says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now say it with me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See that? What's the very next line? Oh, then we start asking for what we want. You see what just happened there? Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's the most important thing. God, I'm going to trust you with this. Now I'm going to let you know what's on my heart, but God, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about what you want. Jesus' instructional prayer starts out with just magnifying and, and glorifying the Father, and then it just says, your will, what, whatever that umbrella of your will is, God, I want that. Now, now here's the thing that I'm asking for. And that would be a game changer in our lives so that was prayer type number one whatever honors you god whatever advances your kingdom accomplishes your will prayer type number two god i want this god i need this here's a good one it's getting just they just get better don't they i deserve this okay i know none of us have ever said this one but i'll do better or be better if you fill in the blank And then last but not least, don't raise your hand if you've ever said this because lightning's probably going to strike you. But God, if you really are good, you will. Mm. Again, don't raise your hand. You ever prayed that? You ever thought those things? What do you think is more honoring to God? Prayer number one or prayer number two? Probably prayer number one, right? That's why the Lord's Prayer starts off like it does. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need at that point. Under the umbrella of your will. What Matthew 6, 9, and 10 doesn't say is, hallowed be my name. My kingdom come. My will be done. But again, that's often how we pray. Here's a couple of verses. You can look them up later. A couple references. James 4, 2, and 3. That's the one that says, You do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Ladies, I know you just went through James. 1 John 5, 14, and 15. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Now, this is kind of strange. You could kind of twist this the wrong way. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Does that mean if we ask not according to God's will that he doesn't hear us? I mean, it's kind of what the verse says, right? I am inclined to believe that the creator and the sustainer of pretty much everything hears whatever he wants to believe or hears whatever he wants to hear. Think of it like this, though. Husbands, you with me? You're bumping heads a little bit with your wife and you say those stupid words, honey, I hear you. And she says that thing back to you. Yes, but are you? Oh, you've heard it too? (laughs) Guilty. I heard you. Yes, but are you listening? And see, I think that's what this verse is saying. God hears us. Of course he does. But is he going to listen to our prayers when we're asking things not in his will, not according to his plan? See, that's where that disconnect is. John 14, 13 says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, there's a huge misconception here. Let me get to the end of what I'm going to say before you want to burn me at the stake, before you want to vote me off the island or throw rotten tomatoes at me, okay? We take this verse or verses and other passages and we automatically think that this means we have to tag the end of our prayers with, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, I am not against saying, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I say it all the time. You hear me pray it all the time. I'm, I'm certainly not against that. We are to pray in his name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Please don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is, and what I don't want us to do, is just because you're supposed to do it, just because you're supposed to say this magical formula line at the end of our prayer, that's not the right reason to say that. Don't just say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen, like just because you have to. Understand what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Now, what does that mean? So, so we say it, if it's not a tag, if it's not this part of the formula of how we have to pray, to say in Jesus' name I pray, or your prayer's not going to work, or it's not going to count, what does praying in Jesus' name mean? Well, it means consistent with my person, purpose, plan, will, and kingdom. In Jesus' name, or in my name, means consistent with my person, purpose, plan, will, and kingdom. Now that makes a little more sense, doesn't it? When we are praying under the umbrella of in his name, in Jesus' name, pray in my name, whatever you ask it, ask it in my name, that means that it is consistent with the person of God, his purpose in our lives, his plan for our lives, his will for our lives, and overall his kingdom. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? I wrote this down as I was making my notes. Those who fully trust God when they pray understand that the answer to their prayer is the will of God. If if you fully trust God, that's what we're talking about now, trusting God. If you fully, fully trust him when you pray, then you understand The answer to your prayer is the will of God, nothing else. Not specifically the thing you ask for. And I'm not saying don't ask God for specific things. Definitely ask God for specific things. But the answer to your prayer is God's will. That's the ultimate answer if you're fully trusting in him. So number one, there's a historical component, remember. Number two, the theological component, trust. Number three, There's a spiritual component, that's believe, a spiritual component. Verse 23, 
It says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Believe. What does that mean to believe? It believe that God is willing and able to do what he says he can do. Now, does this mean that, now we don't have any mountains around here, so this would be tough to try, uh, but say we, you saw the picture of the baptism where, where we went and there's those big rocks right there on the water. Does this mean that you could go down there after service and like, okay, I'm all about prayer, I'm going to do this. I believe, I believe, I believe. Jump. And one of those rocks are going to jump into the water. That's probably not going to happen. But, but you believed, right? That's not exactly what this verse is saying. Jesus is speaking in hyperbole here. He's, he's kind of making this figure of speech. Have you ever heard somebody say, man, they're so awesome, they can move mountains? That's what they're saying. They're very powerful. Man, they're, they're like, they can accomplish amazing things. That's what Jesus is saying here. It says, does not doubt in their heart, but believes. Get rid of that doubt. Why is there any doubt in our hearts when it comes to what God can do or what God wants to do for us. Back to James chapter one, verses six through eight, it says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Just think about, have you ever been, you know, okay, so you can be out in the boat. We're, we're pretty familiar with this. And you'll have a rough day, but there are days where it's just big rollers and they're just, just big rollers and you can just kind of ride them, it's fine. And then there's days that we call sloppy. And you know what I'm talking about, the people that have boats. That's like the waves seem like they're coming from this way one moment and this way, and they're just all over the place, and it's basically like a washing machine. That's what James is talking about here. It's a, a, a person who says they have faith, but they doubt. They're all over the place. They, they, it's like they can't be controlled. It's like they just, they're just this way and that way and uh, whatever. That's what James is saying. He's like, we'd have no room in our spiritual lives to doubt. Verse 7, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, tell us how you really feel about it, James. So not only do we need to trust that God's will is best, but we also need to remove any doubt that God is willing or able to do what he says he can or he wants to do in our lives. I wrote this down too. Believing God is not doubting the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, however he chooses to answer your prayer. That's pretty big. Because if God answers our prayers differently than we would like, or if he doesn't in our timing. You ever have a problem with that? I have a problem with God's timing all the time. I was talking with somebody this morning about that, right? It's like, God, can we get this thing done and snappy? Yeah, probably not the right thing to say to you. But believing God is not doubting the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, however he chooses to answer your prayer. Number one, there's a historical component we've got to remember. Number two, theological component we've got to trust. Number three, a spiritual component of powerful prayer, believe. Number four, number four and five are quick, don't worry. A practical component, a practical component. We've got to ask. We've got to ask him. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. It's pretty simple. We, you know, kind of, hey, God, I, I want to take this thing before you. I want to invite you into my life and this thing. God, this is important to me. Ask him. Ask him. I, I love these verses in Matthew chapter 7. Back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is uh, speaking. Verse 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives... And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Now here's our main verse right here, verse 11. It says, if you then, 
who are evil. Now, we've talked about this verse many times. This doesn't mean like they're wicked, evil people. It just means that they're human. They're sinful people. That's, that's all that Jesus is saying. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? We've got to ask. We've got to go to him. We've got to remember what he's done in the past. We've got to trust in his will. We've got to believe that he is willing and able. And we've got to ask. Now, does this pray, uh, mean that, that you'll get everything that you ask or pray for? No, that's not how it works. Because oftentimes we don't understand God's will. Oftentimes, I hate to say it, just the cold hard facts, we won't understand God's will in this lifetime. But that's where the trust comes in. God, I trust that you want the best for me. I'm going to ask for it. I'm, I'm praying for it. But God, ultimately, this is you. This is not about me. James 4.3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, now it's going back. We can ask, but we've got to ask according to God's will. Let's read our key statement again, just to bring it back up. Prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. Yes, we've got to ask God, but again, we ask, your will be done, not my will be done. Practical component, ask. Here's a twit question. Did Jesus get what he asked for when he prayed in the garden right before he was crucified? Remember that prayer? It's Mark 14, starting in verse 35. It says, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Now, this cup and this hour meant the responsibility of going to the cross. That's what that means, the cup. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So, did Jesus get what he prayed for in the garden? I won't ask you to raise your hand. I think he did. Because he was asking, God, I know what's in store for me. This, this is going to be awful. This is going to be painful. Like, if, like, can we talk about this? That's basically what Jesus is doing in his humanity. And, and this is one of the things I really, really love about Jesus. In his 100% humanity, he's going, uh, what I'm getting ready to go through is going to be excruciatingly awful shameful, like the worst thing ever. So God, if there's another way, that would be really awesome. That was what he prayed for. I love that. Oh, I love that. Okay, I'll get distracted at that. I love it. That's what he prayed for. But then he tagged his prayer at the end, yet not what I will, but what you will. So did Jesus get what he ultimately prayed for? Yes, he did. He prayed for the Father's will, superseding what he had previously prayed for. Number one, historical component. We've got to remember what God has done in the past to believe what he can do in the future. Number two, the theological component, trust. Number three, there's a spiritual component of powerful prayer. We've got to believe that he is willing and able. Number four, the practical component. We've got to ask. And number five, I'm sorry, not sorry, it's a doozy. There's a moral component, and we've got to forgive. We've got to forgive. It's, it's like, man, Jesus, and again, just, just being honest here, you were doing so well, and then you had to throw this one in, right? Man, why did he have to go there? It's really strange. It doesn't look like it actually fits in here. He comes up with this one verse, and it's like, where did that come from? But isn't that true? Jesus fashion here, verse 25, says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven 
may forgive your sins. Apparently, this unforgiveness thing is pretty big to God, I would say. In fact, Scripture is full of instances where it talks about when we have sin in our hearts or sin on our accounts, that God doesn't hear us. And again, that's that thing. He's not listening to our prayers. Of course, he hears us. Like, for instance, Psalm 66, 18 and 19. The writer of the psalm says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Sin hinders our prayers to God. It just does. But according to this passage, the sin of unforgiveness really, really does a number to our prayers. It really hinders God from listening to to our prayers. A lot of think a lot of people think that God doesn't give us choices, right? It's just it's it's God's way. God gives us a choice here. He says, "You can hold a grudge or you can have your prayers answered." But you can't have both. Some pretty clear, pretty serious stuff right here. So here's two questions and we're done. Number 1, What faith-filled prayer have you been asking God in his name that has not been answered? Think about it for a second. Are you in the middle of praying something? Have you given up on praying for something? Do you think God just didn't care anymore? What faith-filled prayer, and, and you've, you're like, yep, I, I got that. I'm, I know God's been awesome in the past. I, I, I trust him. Like, like, I think this is his will. I believe that he can do it. I've asked him for it many, many times. What faith-filled prayer have you been asking God in his name that has not been answered? It's a big question. And I'm not claiming here to have like the golden key to get all your prayers answered, but just one part of it is this whole unforgiveness thing. So that's the first question. Here's here's the follow-up question. Maybe, just maybe, this is you. Is it possible there is someone you need to forgive? Man, this message took a quick turn, didn't it? Had to go there. Is it possible if there is a prayer that has not been answered that you've been praying for a while, is there someone you need to forgive? And again, I don't know that that's the thing. That's not the only important thing of prayer. It might be another sin. It might be just it's not God's timing. It might be God's got some other bigger picture thing. It might be you're praying for something and there's this thing called free will that people get to do what they want to and they can turn from God if they want if you're praying for them to know God. I don't know. I'm just saying according to this passage right here, Jesus says, If there is unforgiveness in your heart, it will get in between you and your prayers to God. So is there someone that you need to forgive? Five components of powerful prayer. Number one, historical component, remember. Number two, the theological component, trust. Number three, the spiritual component, believe. Number four, the practical component, ask. And number five, the moral component, forgive. Forgive. Here's our key statement one more time and then we're done. Prayer is an invitation for God to join you in your pursuit of what's important. Prayer is not a tool to leverage God to get what you want. Let's pray. God, we thank you for prayer. We thank you, as Gabe said earlier, we don't have to go through someone to pray, but that we can go directly to you. We can speak directly to the creator and sustainer of the universe. Thank you for that. Thank you that as we read in Matthew chapter 7, that that just like our earthly fathers want to give good things to us, And we want to give our children so much more, God, you want to give us blessing after blessing. So God, help us to ask. God, help us to remember 
how faithful you have been with us in the past. Remember the amazing things that you have done for us. And I, again, I know, God, sometimes it's tough. But thank you that there is one thing that we can all point to, to remember what you've done, and that's the cross. Thank you for the gift of the cross. So God, help us, if nothing else, to remember that you are good because of that. God, help us to trust your will is better than our will. God, help us to believe that you are willing and able, that you can do what you said you can accomplish. God, help us to be bold enough to ask for the things that you have laid on our hearts. And God, if we are harboring unforgiveness in our hearts at anyone or anything, God, help us to forgive. Give us strength, God, to forgive. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you that Jesus gave us this perfect roadmap. Just another way to come to you. God, I pray for those this morning who are here in person or maybe attending online that they don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Right now in this moment, would they feel their need for you? Would they understand that they cannot do eternity with you without trusting and putting their full faith in Jesus? God, if there are some here this morning who would like to know you as their Savior, just right now would they say, Lord, forgive me. I have sinned against you. And that sin cannot enter into eternity with you. Thank you for making a way for me to spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. I trust that your son Jesus is my savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that prayer today for the first time, I would love to celebrate with you. I'm not gonna call you out or make any commotion, but I'd love to just be able to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today, Trevor. Say, I made a decision for Jesus today. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. God, thank you for life. Thank you for this life on this earth, but more importantly, thank you for eternal life. Thank you that we have an opportunity through your son, Jesus, to spend that eternal life with you. God, help us not to just to dabble in this life of faith, but God, help us to jump in head first. Be all in for Jesus. God, thank you for Island Community Church and the amazing things that you are doing through it. God, help us to be a beacon of hope in this community and in this world. And as this offering comes, God, I just pray that we would be a generous people so that we can reach out into this community and in this world and change it forever. We pray all of this in the amazing powerful, sovereign name of Jesus. Amen.